Hello, this is Henry Schaefer, and welcome to Old and New Testament Survey. It is a summary of the books of the Old and the New Testament. Now, what you're going to get here, you're going to get some unique insight concerning each book of the Bible, key verses that will just jump out at you and bring new revelation to you, relevant truth for today, some special notes that I have dictated and put in my Bible over the years that I have studied. Also, there's going to be a, it will be a brief but comprehensive summary of each book. Now, you can also look for some wow moments uh, of revelation of truth that we're going to give you. Now, if you're ready to start out on Old and New Testament survey, come on and join us. Man, we're going to have a great time studying the Bible together. Now, let's read this here. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes, and he looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him, and he said unto him, Art thou for us, or are you our adversaries? Because Joshua believed in angels too. Mm-hmm. That I just need to know, which one are you? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth, and did worship, and said unto him, what saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. So here as Joshua is getting ready to go into the promised land, is that there is a theophany, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. And he let him know that his presence was there, and stated to Joshua that I am not against you. We are not, you know, I, that God is going before you, and I'm the angel, and I am sent to go with you. It indicates that the sovereignty of, the, of God in human conflicts, isn't that amazing? Mm-hmm. No matter what conflict you're going into, God sends the angel before you to prepare the way for you. Isn't that amazing? Mm-hmm. So God shows us. It, 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 it shows us that God has direct intervention when so he chooses to intervene in life to accomplish, watch this here, his will. Not our will, but his will. And then, of course, another one where Christ is seen in the book of Joshua or salvation, you'll see that uh, uh, Rahab, when she received the spies, they told her to hang out a scarlet thread, a scarlet cord, out the window. And that was in Joshua 2. In verse 21, look at this here. And she said, According unto all your words, so be it. And they sent them away, and they departed, and she bound the scarlet line uh, into the window. And they knew that, that when they came in and they to destroy the city, wherever they found that scarlet cord, her, now watch this here, her and her household would be saved. So it portrays salvation through the blood of and death of Jesus Christ through the red cord. And the, this Gentile prostitute heard the mighty works of God, heard what he did, believed the spies, hid the spies, and was delivered when, when Jericho was destroyed and is found even in the, geon- the genealogy all the way back to Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 5. So this is kind of amazing things. Amen. So let's take let's take just a moment and let's uh, uh, the last part of the, the session here, and let's just pick up a few things, uh, a few stories I want to tell you here about, and some key ideas and some key notes uh, in the book of Joshua. I want you to look at Joshua chapter five and verse two. That's why I'm going to pick that one up. Joshua five and verse two. Because this is a story that people don't really realize what is happening, but God picks it up here in Joshua chapter 5 and in verse 2. And here's what he says. And at that time the Lord said unto Joshua, Make thee a sharp knife and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. Okay? And Joshua made him sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of the foreskins. And this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise. All the people. Now, this is it. So, so amazing. It, and it, yet, it's so simple. 
And he says, watch this here. All the people that came out of Egypt that were males, even all the men of war, died in the wilderness, by the way, after they came out of Egypt. Now, all the people that came out were circumcised, but all the people that were born in the wilderness, by the way, as they came forth out of Egypt, they had not been circumcised. So all those, look here, 20 years old and above, died in the wilderness. Now you got these 19 years old that are not 19, but they're 50, 40 years, 38 years, almost 50. 50, uh, 49, 48, because it's 40 years they've been in there. So you got all these people coming in that are new and have never been circumcised. Now, the thing is, the circumcision was very important in the Jewish religion because that means they were in covenant relationship with God. They're getting ready to go into the promised land and fight, and they're not in covenant relationship with God. They've got to do what the law told them to do as far as the part of the, part of the circumcision. So before they go in to fight, God instructs Joshua again, make sure you get this done because without this, I can't protect them. You see what I mean? So there's a lot of things that we have to make sure that we are, there's a good stories here in this, that a lot of times we go into battle and we're not ready to go in battle. We think we got everything covered, but we don't have it all covered. Maybe there's some things you need to cut off. You know what I mean? And that's what God's showing us. Cut off some bad attitudes. Cut off some, You need to cut off some people. You need to cut off some situations in your life. And these are a lot of stories in here that wow. you can really understand that God is very precise wow. in making sure that we are in covenant relationship, that we are in a covenant relationship with him. Somebody shout amen. amen. So that's some good stuff there anyway. That makes it lessons here. Circumcised before the men go in. Now again, look at this here. In Joshua chapter 5 and verse 12, look at something that happened here. Is that in Joshua 5, in verse 12, the Scripture tells us, oh, let's start at verse 10. And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal, and the, and the men kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month, even at the plains of Jericho. Now, why they're, they're there. They are, they've been circumcised, and they got a hill. So, I mean, they just don't do this here, and you go run down, or you go think you're going to whoop somebody. So they're, they're going to take some time to heal. Amen. That makes sense. This is so I say, Amen. That right, Bill? Amen. amen. Now, wait a minute. Hold on a minute. We've got to rest here for a little bit. And that's what they did. Amen. So all the children of Israel, verse 10, encamped in Gilgal, kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. And they did eat meat of old corn of the land. On the morrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes, parched corn in the self same day. Okay? Now watch this here, verse 12. And manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn and of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna any more, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Now God stopped the food. Okay, you're here, you're in covenant relationship with me. And now you would think that the food would just be laid on the ground again. The guy says, no. And what this, what this key verse is here, that there was no more manna, it's the God gives them incentive to go into the promised land because you're not getting food here no more. You're going to go in there, you're going to take some food, and you're going to eat it. You're going to take the land. Not only that, even when you go in to take the land, you're going to have to get you some food. See what I'm getting at? So God does these for incentive purposes oh, to make these things go on. He's not, he's not spanking them. He's stopping them, and there's an incentive for moving forward uh, in this thing. Isn't this good stuff here? That's I good. like it anyway. That's good. Okay, look at this here. Um, and then, okay, I've already told you about Joshua chapter 5, 13 to 15, the pre-incarnate Christ, the angel that sent before them to go fight. Now, let's do this here. I want to talk again, we talked about curses today, right? So let's bring up a curse here. So let's look at it here in Joshua chapter 6. <coughs> where we're Joshua 6 now. Joshua 6. We're going to pick it up at verse 26. Now, this is with the destruction of Jericho. Jericho has been destroyed. And, the, and then Joshua pronounces a curse 
Now, curses, remember we talked about how Jesus told us in the Gospels that he said when he cursed the fig tree, not only can you do that, he said, but you could say to this mountain, be thou removed. and be." So our words are very, very important. We can bring curses on ourselves. Someone else can speak a curse over us. And that's why we still believe that curses are real. And just and when we say, I don't minimal I don't marginalize this, or say that Jesus became a curse for us and redeemed us from the curse of the law. But all curses are not broken, but the power through Jesus Christ and what he did gives us the power to break the curses. To, to say, no, I don't receive that curse in Jesus' name. I renounce that curse. Does that make sense? Amen. Through what Jesus did. And if Jesus hadn't have done what he did, then we wouldn't have no authority to be able to do it. Right? That the enemy tries to put on us. But here is a curse that Joshua says here in Joshua 6 and verse 26. Jericho has been destroyed. And the gates and the walls are a ruins. Everything is down rubble. And Joshua speaks his curse. And Joshua adjured them at that time saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord that rises up and buildeth this city Jericho. He shall lay the foundation thereof in his firstborn, and his youngest son shall he set up the gates of it. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was noised throughout all of the country. Here is where the curse takes place. This is the history of Israel. Take your Bibles and flip over to 1 Kings, chapter 16. And you're going to find out here in 1 Kings, chapter 16, and verse 34. 1 Kings 16 and verse 34. And this is there they are rebuilding what? Jericho. Watch this here. And in his days did Hiel, the Bethlehemite, build Jericho. He laid the foundations thereof, of Abram, his firstborn, and set up the gates thereof in the youngest son of Segub, according to the word of the Lord which he spake by Joshua, the son of Nun. So when you talk about this here, is that he cost him both his sons. His oldest and his youngest son died when that man built the gates. And he put the gate back up, the, 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 the gates back up. It happened right here with his youngest son and his oldest son. Just like Joshua, the son of Nun, has spake by Joshua. The curse was pronounced, and it goes all the way here into 2 Kings chapter 16 is when the curse is finally established and they die in that. So curses are real and they're still real. 2 Kings 16 and verse 34. 1 Kings, I mean. 1 Kings 16 and verse 34. 1 Kings. 1 Kings 16 and verse 30. It's not 2 Kings. So that curse, whosoever builds the gate, two son, the sons will die. And that's what happens there in Joshua chapter 6. Now let's look at another incident here in Joshua as we're flipping through. It's in Joshua chapter 9. In Joshua chapter 9, um, you'll find out that in Joshua chapter 9, it's called the Gibeonites. The Gibeonites deceive Joshua, and they make a league with the Gibeonites in Joshua 9. What happens, they're coming into the promised land, and the Gibeonites know they're going to come in and kill us too. They're going to destroy all of us. So what the Gibeonites, they fool them. And in Joshua chapter 9, in verse 3, and the when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done unto Jericho, and to Ai, they did work wily, and went and made as if they had been ambassadors, and took old sacks upon their asses, and wine bottles, old and rent and bound, like they had been traveling a long, long way. They were just around the corner. 
Mm-hmm. Oh, they were just right there, but they said, "No, we're gonna, we're gonna." That's the, the devil is deceiving them, and that's exactly the devil comes into church to deceive women, men, pastors. He comes in, he works wildly, mm-hmm. and the and they put old shoes and clouded upon their feet, old garments upon them. Beard, grow their beards on out like they hadn't had time to shave or do anything. Dry and moldy bread. And they went to Joshua and to the camp of Gilgal and said unto them, Now where's Gilgal at? That's where they were circumcised and all that. Mm-hmm. See what I'm getting at? Mm-hmm. And said unto them, unto the men of Israel, We be come from a far country. Now therefore make a league with us. And the men of Israel said unto the uh, Hivites, Peradventure, where do you dwell among us, and how shall we make a league with you? And they said unto Joshua, We are thy servants. And Joshua said unto them, Who are ye, and from whence come ye? And they said unto him, From a far country. Now you got to realize, you got this angel that's appeared. you got this angel who's appeared to him, going to go with him and fight for him. Walls done fall, has done fallen down. Miracles have happened. And you got a group of people who are deceiving them. And you think about the story in our own lives, how the enemy comes and can de- and deceive us as well with this here. And, and I, to make a long story short, let's do it here. Verse 14. And the men took their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. They didn't talk to God about it. They said, we will make a league with you. You know what I mean? We will not come into your far land and destroy your land. And they were just around the corner. And it came to pass that at the end of three days after they had made a league with them, that they heard that they were just their neighbors (laughs) and that they dwelled among them. And the children of Israel journeyed and came to their cities on the third day, only three days away. Now the cities were Gibeon, uh, Chinepria, and Beroth, and Kirjath Jerem, and the children of Israel smote them not. Why did they not kill them? Because they made a loop with them. They had already said, "We will make them." They already, they're bound to the word. So the princes of the congregation had sworn unto them by the Lord, and all the congregation murmured against the princes. Uh, and the, and the princes had already told them. They said, "We may not touch them." Verse nineteen, and verse twenty one. And the princes said unto them, "Let them live." But let them be hewers of wood and drawers of water unto the congregation that the princes had promised them. So when you look at this here, these people are going to be thorns upon their sides all the days of their life Mm -hmm. because they made a league with them and they will not be able to destroy them. And God had already told them to destroy them all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Amen. That's people who come into the church, Mm -hmm. let's say husband and wife, they're not believers. You want to marry them, you make a league with them, and because you don't seek God out, is this the one for me? That unbeliever now is going to be married together, and you're going to have the thorn in your side the rest of the days of your life. Amen. See what I mean? Amen. Because they didn't ask counsel of God. Oh, they look good. Man, look at that. I felt so sorry for him. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's the story in that. That makes sense. Amen. So let's just pick it up on here, and uh, and uh, that's the Gibeonites. I mean, that was something that happened to them. Those are, those are lessons for us. Amen. That makes sense. Look at this one here in Joshua, chapter ten, Joshua chapter ten, twelve to fourteen. Moses, uh, Joshua's getting ready to fight. You couldn't say this. You couldn't say this. I mean, you, you couldn't talk about Joshua without bringing this up. Joshua 10, verse 12. Joshua, and then spake Joshua unto the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the people of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Son, S U N, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Yasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. So the miracle that God gave them a whole day to fight, 
the Amorites and the sun stood still. You know, we've seen the sun in the sky and the moon in the sky at the same time here. Mm-hmm. Don't we say, ain't that weird having the moon over there and the sun over there? But we can see it as well. Same sun, same moon. But they, God had that stand still for Joshua. And verse 14, And there was no day like that before or after it, that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. It's amazing, isn't it? So let's go ahead and pick up this one here. Um, Joshua 13. In verse 1, this is what I want to show you here. Joshua 13 and verse 1. In Joshua's day, now Joshua was old and stricken in years, and the Lord said unto him, Thou art old and stricken in years. <laughs> yep. And there remaineth yet very much land to be possessed. See, it wasn't all done yet under Joshua. So he's still got land to possess. And... Um, Joshua's getting old in that. Okay? I wanted to show you that. And where were we at just now? Joshua 13 and 1. There we go. And so let's pick it up in Joshua 22, 9 to 10. I've got all these notes written down here. I'll make sure I want to tell you some of the stories. Joshua 22. It is boring, everybody. No. It's just going through the Bible. <laughs> Joshua 22, 9 and 10. This is, I want to tell you what's happening here. People are getting ready to divide the land up across the Jordan River and different rivers that are there. Okay, And it's going to be a long ways from where the ark's going to be at. I mean, they're going into their possession land. And here's what happens. A group of people decide they, they, they erect an altar, a big altar, huge altar. And you would think this would be a good thing, but it's here in Joshua 22, 9 to 10. And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe Manasseh returned and departed from the children of Israel out of Shiloh, which is the land of Canaan, to go into the country of Gilead, into the land of their possessions, whereof they were possessed according to the word of the Lord of Moses. And when they had come unto the borders of Jordan, that are in the land of Canaan, and the children of Reuben, and the children of Gad, and the half-tribe of Nassau, built there an altar by Jordan, a great altar for everybody to see. All right, this huge altar they built, right there at the edge of the river. And look at it, verse 20. And verse 20 says this here, Then the children of Reuben... And the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh answered and said unto all the heads of the thousands of Israel. Now Israel has heard that they have built an altar. The other people have heard they built a huge altar. And they're going, what is our brethren building this huge altar for? Because God has not told them to do that. And they're thinking they're building a false altar to a false god. So here's what they said in verse 20. They says, The children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh answered and said to the heads of the thousands, and look at what they said here, For the Lord hath made Jordan a border between, verse 25, between us and you. Ye children of Reuben and the children of Gad, ye have no part in the Lord, so shall your children make our children cease from fearing the Lord. They thought that the river divided them. So they thought that when they died off, that their children would say, your children has no part. You're on the other side of the river. You have no part in what God is doing on this side of the river. So what they decided to pick it up. So therefore we said, let us now prepare to build us an altar, not for burnt offerings, nor for sacrifice, but that it may be a witness between us and you and our generations after us that we might do the service of the Lord before him with our burnt offerings and with our sacrifices, and with our peace offerings that your children may not say to our children in the time to come you have no part with us. So they're saying we're building this altar to let you know this is something that represents the service to the Lord. We're not going to sacrifice here but this is a memorial. It's like the 12 stones. See what I'm getting at? So they built this altar and um, where am I at here now? It's 25 to 28. Therefore we shall 
have our, that, and let's, and let's pick it all the way up to verse 34. What's the name of this altar? It had a name. Look at it here. Verse 34, And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad called the altar Ed. E-D. Ed. And this is really what it means. Now, what I, I want to show you this here. You see how those words that are italicized in your King James Bible, words that are italicized are words that were added for clarity. But Ed, does <laughs> the word Ed don't clarify anything to me, does it you? So look at, so, so look at the colon. Every time you read Scripture, the, see, the, the Scriptures were not, did not have punctuation. And the punctuation was added during the translations. And the colon, to the right of the colon, is the emphasis of the Scripture. The interpreter said, to the right of the colon is what we believe the whole Scripture is trying to emphasize. So look at it here. It says, And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad call the altar Ed, capital E, small d, colon. And here's what it means. For it shall be a witness between us that the Lord is God. So the Ed means it is a witness. That, that, that a witness between us that the Lord is God. So here's the thing. They built an altar, called it Ed. Huh? And I preached a message on this, the altar called Ed. Does anybody remember this? No? Huh? Well, probably wasn't one of my best ones. but Anyway, it was called the altar called Ed. And, oh, that was with the other people. So anyway, <laughs> but what it meant, but what it really meant was that, that God was showing us that this altar is something that we should have. And it's all right to have an altar. So that's where my mama and my daddy always went to go pray. It's good to have an altar. We're, so I don't know where your altar is. Where do you like to go pray at? What do you like to do? And they said, that, that mom, and, mom and dad, they always used to go there. And that's where they prayed at. The altar called Ed. Somebody shout amen. amen. And then you pick it. So you wouldn't even, you read the story. I think this is just great stuff myself. I just love going through this here, Joshua. And then let's pick it up here in Joshua uh, 24 and 15. That's the uh, Joshua plaque. If it, seem, if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. And then Joshua dies. Pick it up here in Joshua 24. In verse 29, and it came to pass after these things that Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being a hundred and ten years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnathurah, which is in Mount Ephraim on the north side of the hill Gash. And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua. And all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua and which had known all the works of the Lord, and that he had done. And the, bones of jo and the bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt, buried they in Shechem, in the parcel of ground which Jacob bought of the sons of Hamor and the sons of Shechem for the hundred pieces of silver, and it became the inheritance of the children of Joseph. So that pretty much wipes out the book of Joshua, sums it up. A lot of good stuff in Joshua. Amen. A lot of good stories, a lot of good lessons, a lot of things that God pours out to us to have and everything. So Amen. come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise for the book Amen. of Joshua. Amen. I like Joshua. All right. And in, in invasion of the conquest of Canaan, the vision of the land, and then the conclusion is chapters 22 and 24. Any questions as we get ready to wrap this thing up? Got anything to say? Got any questions for me? You got any? Yes, ma'am. Speak one, up. Speak up loud. I have one note in my scriptures where I was reading in Joshua 23. I got a lot of notes, but this one is mention worthy. Um, verses 10 and 11. <laughs> Well, hello, Henry Schaefer here again as your Bible teacher and the host of the program Old and New Testament Survey. I hope you've enjoyed the program. Now you can reach me at henry at cwchrist.com. That's henry at cwchrist.com. If you've got any comments or got any questions, look forward to seeing you again. God bless.